So, uh, small world. Small world. Small world. Well, I think before we talk about small Felipe world. Felipe K Arts. It's a small world. Don't we, even. Don't even. We got to so, talk about Vinci. So, small world is made. Why by, you think we got to talk about Vinci first? No, I'm saying by Felipe K Arts. And Vinci is made by Felipe K Arts. As is another game called Evo, which is a fun little game that I played once at uh, RIT with Professor Richmond. I'm trying to remember if I played that. The little uh, evolution game. I don't remember. I uh, remember Evo for the SNES. There. Different. Oh my god, that yeah. game was awesome and <laughs> but terrible. But anyway, so we were at uh, we were at a gaming store one day, and there was this game Vinci on the discount table, right? And Alex was, uh, and then he bought it. And I basically all he had heard about the game was that it was a out of print. And B, that there were some flaws in it. Like, I knew they had typos and some other, like, flaws in the instructions. So we got Vinci uh, at the discount bin, and we played it, and it was actually a fantastic game, right? Uh, and basically, the idea of Vinci is it's sort of risk-like, where you have units and you conquer space territories on a map. Uh, well, we did a whole show on it. Well, we did we? In 2007. Oh, so go back and listen to our 2007 yeah. Vinci show. So basically, Small World is the same game remade with a skin right so that basically vinci had those flaws with it so the same guy years later as in a couple years ago maybe a year or two ago he remade the game changed a bunch of the rules to polish it up he changed the theme to make it fantasy like so as opposed to abstract. generic generic europe yep. medieval crap right so that it would sell on game shelves uh, he fixed the typos. He basically redid the game while keeping most of the rules. So it's 90% the same game. Put out by Days of Wonder, so you it's might as well be call the it, right shelves yeah, next to all the other Days of Wonder games you that might as well call popular. It, you might as well call it Vinci 2.0, right? And he put out this game Small World, and we bought it, and we finally got around to playing it, despite it being crazy popular. And you know what? It's pretty good. If you were on the hedge, you might as well just buy it. It's a solid yeah, I mean, game. You're not, it's not like you're going to buy a copy of Vinci. No. Right? So you, you might probably, as well buy a copy of Small World. Now, one thing I have to say, this is kind of an aside, but I've never had this experience until now of having played a game and knew the rules very well, and then having played a game that is based on that game so much that it's almost the same game. It is way harder to learn the rules of the second game that's almost the same. Well, I think it's because you don't put in the full effort of reading the rules straightforwardly, right? Because what you do is you well, just look, I know you all look, the rules. Right, so you look for the rules differences and you skip over the rest, but the other problem with that is you get to a section of the rule book and you say, oh, I know this rule, and you skip over it but really there might have been something different in there you missed because you skipped over it because you're not also days of wonder games have kind of crap instructions usually which makes it kind of yeah. hard to parse anyway it's kind of hard it, it's like once you know a rule it's hard it's like it's easier to, to search a rule book with your eyes if you don't know the rules at all than it is to search them you know being very familiar with yeah them. well this is an aside this is definitely in the shit talking stage but after packs and after things calm down i started on this privately because i realized that 90% of the rules I've ever read for any board game piss me off, and I know exactly what to fix because I've written so much tech documentation in my life. Yep. I want to write a stupid RFC, and here's how to write the rules for a board game. People already... It's, the thing is that information's already out there, but people don't... It's not in a format that people who write board game rules would ever find. Eh. It's also not obvious. It is not like, do this, then this, in this exact format. Mm -mm. That's just... I'm, I'm going for it. But anyway, so... We ran into weird problems. Like, we're playing, and then halfway through the game, we're like, wait a minute, do you have to be contiguous? Because in Vinci, in, you had to be contiguous. You were Yeah, fucked. you couldn't, in Vinci, you, got bisected. you weren't allowed to have, say, a territory on the left and a territory on the right. All your territories had to be touching each other unless you had, uh, what was it, astronomy or something like that? It was the one, yeah, the one that Messages. lets you be discontiguous. There was, yeah, there, were, there was basically a special power that let you be discontiguous. Otherwise... You couldn't. You had to keep all your stuff connected. But in Small World, we couldn't find a rule in the rule book, correct us if we're wrong, that says you had to be connected. You could actually let your guys split up. You could take all, you know, it didn't matter. Yep, we might be wrong. We only played the game twice. And I read the, I checked the rules. I couldn't find anything about yep. being forced to be contiguous, which S significantly changes the game. So huge Because you can basically conquer a territory temporarily for a turn and then abandon it to get more valuable territories on the other side. So the gist of the game, in case you've never played Vinci, is that there's a list of set of races and a set of powers, and they are randomly combined into a list, like, uh, I don't know, Dragon Rider Elves, or uh, giant Spectral Giants. Stout Gnomes. Actually, I had Spectral Rat Men, which was both hilarious and overpowered. Yes. Uh, the ones that we noticed that were overpowered were uh, Spirit is definitely overpowered. Uh, I don't think they're overpowered. I think the people we played with did not optimally fuck. Possibly. But <laughs> so you, you pick a race 
and there's a there's like a loadout, a draft. So if you want to pick one, it's free. If it's at the top of the list, you have to pay victory points to skip over them to get one further down the list. Yeah. And you leave those victory points on the ones you didn't take, which is a very elegant way of balancing the game. Yeah. So initially, at the beginning of the game, there is sort of a random factor, right? If you go first and an awesome combination is in the first slot, you can get it for free without having to pay victory points. Ah, but going first appears to be a disadvantage right. in the long run. It does because by going onto the board first, everyone can just come in on top of you and there's not much you can do about it unless you're like the super strong defensive hobbits or something like that. So you come onto the board. The game is deterministic with one twist in that to conquer a territory, you know, you'll, you pick up all your guys from the board except the ones who are holding on to territories every round and then you throw them all back on the board and instead of risk where it's like, all right, I roll the dice to see if my 10 guys beat you four dice, guys or whatever, it costs two guys to take a territory, plus one for every enemy guy on it, plus any other modifiers that may be in place, like right. forest plus one, mountain plus one. So it's completely deterministic, all the combat. It's like, you know, it requires this many units to conquer these territories, but everyone has a limited number of units, so you can only expand your empire so far, and you ha you can't do it all in one turn. You have to do it over the course of many turns. Also, the more you expand, the less you can expand in the future, and the more difficult it is to defend, because you have more places mm -hmm. to defend with a limited number of units. Yep. Also, every race gets a a different number of yeah. units. So what you do is when you've sort of reached the limit of your expansion or you don't feed, right? What you do is you decline. And that, Diocletian! That empire now becomes a declining empire. You basically stop playing it but it stays on the board and you, you go and you get a new empire. And you keep getting points from it. Right, but you get points from the old empire. So what you want to do is you want to have a big old empire that still exists and a big current empire that still exists, and you want them both simultaneously so that we can get double points from having two double si points. simultaneous empires, an old one and a new one, and as long and then as as the old one gets disintegrated, then you decline the new one and you come onto the board with another one. So you always have two going and you cycle them and then you get the most points and win. Now this mechanic is awesome because it works a lot like a Formula One race with the pitting. You basically have to pit. And when you when you decline, you do it at the start of your turn, but you get victory points from your turn at the end of your turn. So on a normal turn, you do all your conquest, get all your victory points. You probably have a whole bunch of bonus powers from your race. If you decline, you do fuck all. You, you don't just do anything. You flip over all your guys. All your powers go away. You get some points. You get some points. Not a lot. And then you don't come back out of the board until the next round. It feels really rough to decline. Unless you have uh, what is stout. It, stout. If you're stout, which is the same thing as Rebirth and Vinci, you can decline at the end of your turn, which means you can take a turn and then decline and then without wasting a turn, which is incredibly powerful. Now, when you decline, it's like being punched in the face. It's like playing Age of Steam. But remember when you're playing this game, everybody has to decline at some point. Yeah, and when you come back onto the board, it's like super awesome, tally-ho, here I come with a brand new set of guys, and I can just kick someone right in the ass because they left the edge of the board undefended. Kabla. Yep. So the game... Pretty much is that, and it goes a set number of turns, and then the game is over. Unlike now, Vinci, which went to a set number of victory points. Yeah, that was that's much more interesting, right? I mean, in Vinci, it was a set number of victory points. You couldn't be, you couldn't really, you had to work really hard to schedule your declines, right? Because scheduling on the uh, declining on the final turn of the game can only hurt you, right? So it's all about when is the game going to end? How many turns are left? In Small World, you know exactly how many turns are left. You That's a huge dynamic changer, coupled with the fact that Vinci had open scoring. It had, you know, the 90s style score tracker on the board. Mm -hmm. Small World has victory point tokens that are supposed to be kept secret. Now, you can keep count. It's basically just a who can actually keep count thing. But I think what they were trying to remove from the game is the fact that the end of Vinci always came down to... Pete is winning. I'm going to fuck Pete in the ass yeah, to prevent him from going over the edge. Yeah, because not everyone has counted the victory points. and they're I being count them. I know exactly I, who to I fuck. I absolutely counted them, but not everyone has counted them. Therefore, it's difficult to convince everyone to say gang up on the leader. And also, ganging up on the leader isn't necessarily going to help you win because you're not going to, say, delay the end of the game because the end of the game is coming no matter what. So if they've already got more points, the only thing you can do with a limited number of turns is maximize your points. It in, also in Vinci, you could actually slow the game down. Attacking the leader would actually, you know, give you another turn, possibly. Whereas in Small World, attacking the leader, unless that's the optimal way for you to get points, 
points isn't going to help you as much. This also removes some of the tension from the end of the game because if you don't know exactly when the game is going to end, you might have to really make a tough decision as to whether or not to decline. The game might end. You might get fucked. You don't know. In this game, if you decline in the last round, you're an idiot. Yeah, it's like you. Could, I just looked and I, I, I won the second game we played demonstratively right and what i did is you know i had uh i had spirit guys who stayed around the whole game getting me points that helped a lot uh but the other thing i did was i basically looked and i said you know with this many players this is gonna be 10 turns i think it was 10 turns right i said i will decline on these turns and i did exactly that i kept to that schedule and i declined exactly three times it's I think. The and because the game is clockwise it is the exact same end game dynamic that happens in El Grande with the big and the low bidding. Yep. It's the exact same thing. So I, you know, if I play, you know, with any number of players, it doesn't matter. I'm going to look at how many turns there are. I'm going to figure out the optimal declining schedule and I'm going to try to pick my combinations based on, of course, how many points they'll get me, but also Will they stick to my declining schedule, right? If I'm if I'm if I'm behind, I got to pick a race that will be able to decline more quickly. Or if I'm if I'm ahead, then I got to pick a slow race that needs like three turns to expand. I'll be like, how many turns will it take for that race to decline? That's how I'm going to judge them when I pick yep. them, right? That's a two turn race. That's a three turn. You know, it's a four turn. And then I could pick and so that I decline at exactly the right times to get the maximum of points out of every single turn. So the races and the powers in Vinci they were very abstract. Well, in and Vinci very you. Could there weren't separate races and powers. It was just chits, and they could be combined any which way. Yep, you could have double and something. Yeah, I mean, you could have double just... barbarian. You could. Oh have, my god, that's a lot you of could barbarians. Have diplomacy, currency. You could have, you know, astronomy and mining. You could have all sorts. But of But the just powers were also very abstract, and usually came down to numbers games. Yep. In Small World, the powers are all. Way out there, Dune style, crazy bullshit. Like some guys get dragon that they can just put somewhere and is fucking invincible. Yep. But at the same time, there's a lot less diversity in terms of the number of units you get. Right? Yes. So in Vinci, you could you could have a one you know civilization could have like five units, and, and one guy's got like one fourteen. Could have fourteen. In this. All of the special powers have either three, four, or five. Most of them have four. Only one of them has three. And all the races, the, div the diversity and the number of units they get is very the small. The game gives you the exact minimum number of pieces. Yeah, so almost everyone has like nine, ten, eleven-ish guys. Almost everyone. I think you could have as many. I think there's a combination that lets you have like 13 maybe. Yep. No, and there is a combination that lets you have like five, which is the dwarf, uh, the dwarf something. The equivalent of currency. Yeah, I pick that combination and I got hosed <laughs> so the, this factor of the fact that the numbers are pretty much all in line and the powers are all equally crazy means that the game is almost too well balanced like no matter what civilization you pick unless you pick those fucking dwarves with the currency you're coming onto the board roughly as strong as everyone else it's very balanced and very deterministic and very I don't know I dislike it a little bit compared to Vinci because of that. Yeah, in Vinci, for example, you, if you picked mining, you would go for the pickaxes on the board and they would be worth two points and that was crazy awesome. And you would, right? So everyone would be like, oh shit, don't let him take the, ah, crap, he's got mining mountaineering, fuck. And but you, in, in Small World, you can pretty much, with any civilization, you have like four different ways to come onto the board that are equally viable and it mostly doesn't matter who you attack. And yeah, it's, it's just like, kinda... and there's, it's not, there's nothing that gives you that many points that is so much greater than everything else so it's like okay these guys get points on green and these guys get points on wizard marks and these guys get points on this so it's a everyone's better, gonna get bonus points from something it's a better it, tighter game in some ways which at the same time reduces certain kinds of strategies from the previous game yeah and, it's like on the one hand we should be happier there's less randomness but on the other hand it's like well it's so you know ah but they added randomness with the die in oh Vinci, i forgot about in that. vinci you throw out all your guys and you have extra guys that's it in this if you've got one guy I left at least you can roll this die you have a chance of conquering one more thing which is great and that it unsticks the game mm -hmm. but it's also a little bad in that it's random but i feel like if that weren't in the game i would have just given up on this game because it's so well balanced that without that little bit of randomness it would have immediately solidified yeah, it's weird that they bet that, right? And the, the thing is, they putting victory points on the races to skip over them is supposed, or I guess civilizations, is supposed to be the factor that 
on that makes up for the fact that they're so unbalanced. Well, because it costs way more to skip them in uh, Vinci, too. It only costs one victory point, and you get a fuck ton of victory points in Small World. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's like, you know, in Vinci, it's like, okay, one raise, one Civ might be way more powerful than another one, but you got to pay a lot to skip over to the good ones. So it's okay that they're unbalanced, because some guy who gets stuck with a crappy Civ is going to get a ton of victory points. Getting victory points from taking a Small World Civ that wasn't great for the map never really seems no, to matter. No, it doesn't help you at all. You might as well pay the four victory points to get something more awesome, right? But that, you know, <laughs> while I have these complaints, the game is still great. Like, they're, they're balanced out by one, the theme is great. Like, the icons on the characters and their little, like, <laughs> logos are pretty great. Yeah, the art, the art of this game, I mean, the Vinci art was pathetic. Utilitarian. Yeah. Uh, I liked it. It looked a lot like the game with the Rondel. No, oh, uh, what's that called? Antique. 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 Yeah. But uh, there's actually a Rondel series, you know. I know. Um, I know. I, I always kind of want to buy it. Then I remember that Antique wasn't that great. No. Uh, Goa is, is great, though. Yeah. It's not a Rondel game. I don't yeah. know. Um, but, and also, the game, it tokenized a lot of the stuff that you just had to know in the old game. Like, pretty much every power has tokens to represent it. There are so many unique pieces to make sure that you know the count. Everything is uniform. It's kind of like... If Vinci were second edition D and D, then this is third edition. Yep, everything's tokenized. Everything's literal. Everything's worth one. Everything's very simplified. It makes the game very accessible, and it's still a great game. It's just yeah. I mean, to make a game that is actually you know Vinci, kind of a you know somewhat hardcore game. It's right? to make it as accessible as Small World has made it is quite a design accomplishment. I consider it equal to Vinci. They're equal but different. If you like one. You will probably like the other, but you will like them for different reasons. Yeah, and they're so similar, you know, despite being different, that only hardcore people will care about these differences, and the vast majority of people will just love either game. Yeah. Uh, which mean, but the vast majority of people will like Small World better because it's more well produced and you know streamlined and easier rules and better arts and all that stuff. So it's a great game. You just should fucking buy it. play Small World if you haven't. Is the reason it's popular. Now there, there are, are a million expansions. A million expansions. I haven't played any of them but my suspicion is that some of them are probably good and some of them are probably Carcassonne Catapult I was gonna say the Catapult <laughs> I have no idea uh, which ones are good which ones are bad if any I will have to do this research uh, at a later date yep so I don't, buy the game if you're a board gamer it's a game that just it deserves a place in your library oh absolutely This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brando K for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night. 